The Arctic is a magical place. Mankind has been trying to conquer it for decades. And that endeavor's becoming easier. Because of climate change, the ice is melting faster and faster. Now the battle for the Arctic's resources has begun. It's one of the last untouched regions on Earth where people have left few traces. It's something that's very worth protecting. They've long become a symbol for dramatic changes in the once eternal ice. At the moment, the ice still presents a natural barrier. Powerful icebreakers are needed to get through it. Russia dominates the Arctic sea routes. This nuclear-powered icebreaker has 74,000 horsepower. It's the largest, most advanced vessel of its kind in the world. Even ice sheets four meters thick are no problem for Captain Dmitry Lobusov. This icebreaker can reach almost any location in the Arctic Ocean. The battle for the Arctic is coming to a head. Russian scientists are concerned about the unique landscape. So the fighters for this pancake now are more equipped, more powerful, more rich, so they have a better device to catch this pancake. This Russian giant isn't the only one here. A good thousand kilometers further south in Tromsø, the Norwegians are moving a different kind of steel giant into position. This is the Songa Enabler oil rig. It cost almost a billion euros to build. The Norwegian company Statoil hopes to discover enormous oil reserves here and has penetrated further north than anyone else so far. The manager's on his way to the heart of the rig, the drilling platform. So what always amazes me is that this pop you see here now, it's just a small piece of steel, right? That's what does the whole job. And it's all this organization and the platform and the engineering art, it's all around this small piece sticking up here and doing all the work for us. No other oil rig in the world is as well protected against the cold. It can operate at temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees centigrade. Many areas of the rig are hermetically sealed to keep out the Arctic cold. All the important areas can be heated. That means the helipad is always free from snow and ice. That's absolutely vital for the crew. The supplies from the air are their only link with the outside world. The alarm goes off on the Songa enabler. Safety drills are part of the crew's daily routines. They get to the source of the problem within four minutes, which is within the permitted time limit. Of course, it can be risky. Uh, we know that uh, lives have gone lost in, in, in oil business, and hopefully it won't happen again uh, because we are controlling the risk. But the risk is there. We can never, uh, we can never look away from the risks because uh, if we do that, of course, we will lose more lives. The human and material effort is enormous, and it's all to one end. Yeah, we like to make history, uh, and and uh, and uh, I, I know that if we if we discover an elephant up here, uh, as we call it, uh, it will be historical. Uh, it will uh, gain much more activity up there, uh, which will be good for uh, for both me and for the business, of course. The Arctic is rich in natural resources. Oil, gas, ores, and precious stones have been harvested from here for more than a hundred years. 
the retreat of the ice is now making the heart of the Arctic more accessible. Experts believe there are huge oil and gas reserves there. In the fjord, the crew of the Songa Enabler make their final preparations for their big trip. None of them know what problems they're about to face. The Arctic ice has been in retreat for at least 25 years. Older layers of ice in particular are disappearing. The Arctic Ocean's changing fast. Climate change is producing winners and losers. The prospects for polar bears are bleak. Adapted to hunting seals on the ice, they struggle on land. But Arctic foxes need terra firma. They now have to share their habitat. For the birds, the fact that large tracts are now more often ice-free is a plus because their food sources are accessible for longer. The Russian icebreaker continues on its voyage. This juggernaut is called 50th Anniversary of the Victory. One of the people on board is Jan Breeder from Germany. He's the expedition leader en route to the North Pole. During the 29 trips that I've made to the North Pole, the amount of ice has really varied. We've encountered ice at 76 degrees north, sometimes at 82 degrees north. We'll see what we'll find this year. They're heading to the North Pole via the Franz Josef Land archipelago. It takes them five days from Murmansk. On board are crew members, tourists and scientists. The vessel has been equipped to spend very long periods in the ice. It wouldn't need to find a port for a year. It's a floating city with a pool, a gym and a large onboard kitchen. The icebreaker has more than a thousand cabins and rooms. The journey takes the passengers through a pristine landscape, but that could be over soon. I worry about the development of the military presence in the Arctic, both from the Russian side and the same is from the Canadian side, and also to the US. They also uh, develop the Arctic military facility, all countries. One reason is that no one can say exactly where the borders are. Apart from the maritime borders around Greenland, only those between the United States and Russia have been internationally established. Other maritime borders, such as between Norway and Russia, are potentially explosive. The status of the Arctic Ocean is unclear. If enormous amounts of natural resources are found, it could spark an international conflict. One nation has already made a move to stake its claim. I consider this Russian flag on the North Pole floor is the same as American flag on the moon. It's the same just uh, demonstration of that. We can go there, we can dive, we can fly, we can put, so it's a sign, but nothing more. Like a big boy game. Whether she likes it or not, it is also part of the game. Scientists and their research are enormously important for politicians and industry. Maria's current task is to gather climate data all over Franz Josef land. She has an entire Arctic summer to do it. The ship's helicopter flies back and the trip to the North Pole continues without the biologist. The only residents on this island are Maria and her team and lots of polar bears. Three more days to the North Pole. Spitsbergen, Norwegian territory. Greenpeace tries to get in touch with the Russian trawler. Its only response is a warning. 
They weren't particularly kindly disposed to us. We said we'd keep a safe distance, and they said if we didn't come too close, it would be fine. But if we did, they wouldn't be able to guarantee that they'd remain friendly and peaceful. Approaching the trawler's risky. It's currently fishing and has full nets. Larissa Boima is visibly tense. The Russian crew might feel they're being provoked. These nets that they drag over the ocean floor are the size of a football pitch and as high as a three-story building. They're huge and they're dragged across the sea floor, destroying everything in their path. A short while later, the Russian captain changes course and heads straight at the Greenpeace boat. It has to turn away. Machismo in the Arctic. Because of the retreat of the sea ice, Russian trawlers such as this one can fish further and further north. That has devastating consequences for the Arctic ecosystems. The life in the Arctic is in danger, a place that's a paradise underwater too. It's a kaleidoscope of shapes and colors. Special robotic cameras can dive down to 400 meters. Greenpeace wants to use them to document the current damage caused by trawlers from all over Europe, including Germany. The trawl nets are dragged along the bed because this is a prime place for cod. You can see the scars they leave. The results are shocking. You can see the extent of the destruction. And yet fishing boats are heading further and further north. We want to halt the spread of industrial fishing into currently untouched areas of the Arctic. We're demanding that the Norwegian government sets up protected zones in the maritime areas around Spitsbergen. Greenpeace has won some battles to protect the Arctic. According to their own information, businesses like Birdseye and McDonald's are staying away from fish from sensitive regions. Maybe it's a small breather for the fascinating world around Spitsbergen. The Songa Enabler has started its journey. It's heading into the Arctic Ocean, the crew searching for the northernmost oil fields. Uh, the first challenge we see now is this uh, narrow passage over here, uh, which is only 300 meters wide. Uh, the rig is uh, just about 100 meters. Uh, so we don't want to touch anything. Uh, it's also a, a kind of sensitive area for the organizations uh, like, for instance, Greenpeace. If they try to slow us down, uh, that, that, that will be the place that it's easier for them, I suppose. The cutting-edge oil rig is self-powered, just like a ship. The team's nervous. Running aground would put an abrupt end to this trip. The narrow strait is exploited by Greenpeace activists. Their protest plays well in the media. They want to speak out against the dangers of the oil industry. Although the oil industry is in fact already investing millions to make oil rigs more environmentally friendly and safer. I think we need those organizations as, as well because they, they push us in a way, right? So if, if, if I or, or the oil industry will, will, um, will make the rules how we do it, it would probably be cheaper, <laughs> right? So they have to push, push the limits and, and, and make us better together. Greenpeace can't stop the oil rig. Nobody knows what will happen if the Songa enabler finds what it's looking for in the Arctic. It's 200 nautical miles to the North Pole. Their course is 90 degrees north. The Russian icebreaker's 24,000 tons are unstoppable. The team of scientists on board includes Alex Cohen from England. He's a geologist from the University of Cambridge and an expert on Arctic ice and climatology. 
Uh, it probably is an important time in history for the Arctic. Uh, over the last few decades, we've seen a dramatic change in the type of ice. Uh, on the way to and from the pole, I want to collect data on thickness and extent of sea ice. And then when we get there, I want to check the situation at the North Pole and hopefully get some depth and salinity profiles of melt ponds. Tourists can also travel to the North Pole on the icebreaker for tens of thousands of euros per head. The expedition leader is careful in his calculations. We wouldn't offer a trip to the North Pole if we were exposing our passengers to a risk. Of course, you have to bear in mind that in the high Arctic, you're far away from civilization, so we have to weigh up the risks. We have to be prepared for all eventualities, but nature will show us what our limits are. Traveling to the Arctic is an exclusive and very expensive adventure, which has limited tourist numbers to date. But some scientists see advantages in changing that. I think tourism is a really powerful tool for educating people. If nobody knew about the Arctic, nobody would care enough to save it. So it's really important that we bring people here and show them the Arctic, show them why it's special and why it's worth saving. Cruise liners can't come as far north as this icebreaker, and the captain's pleased to have the tourists on board they help keep the expensive vessel afloat financially. It can travel at 22 knots with two sets of turbines powered by nuclear reactors. Being the dominant force in the Arctic costs billions. The Russians already have more than 40 icebreakers. Russia doesn't just have plans. It's already building three new nuclear-powered icebreakers. One hull is already complete, the second is about to be complete, and the third is already in the dock. This is roughly what these new icebreakers will look like. Icebreakers are the key to the Arctic, more and more futuristic, more and more powerful. But the battle for the Arctic isn't just a battle for natural resources, it's also a battle for living space. We're flying to a village whose days are numbered. Shishmaref is threatened by climate change, as are 32 other communities in Alaska. The village is home to 600 native Inupiat Alaskans, Improvisation is the key to survival here. There's no harbor. Brothers Fred and Johnny are hunting. Like many in the village, they catch seal, caribou, and sometimes whale. They are Native Americans, so they don't need a license to do it. Climate change has drastically changed their environment. Yeah, in the past, we would be uh, crossing with our snow machine. This would all be frozen where we're boating here. It's very rare that we're boating in November. People here live in harmony with nature. Civilization has given them a church, two shops, and a modern school. But there are no restaurants or cinemas. They live from storm to storm. Every storm surge robs them of more of their home. That's an important issue at the village meeting. The consequences of climate change have to be monitored. There's a playground here, but as you can see, where, where my finger is, is, is the ocean. Um, the playground that I grew up playing in is in the ocean. This is the house that um, my husband grew up in. That is now in the ocean. Shishmaref has been shrinking for years. In 10 to 30 years, the village could be uninhabitable. Several storm surges have destroyed many houses since 1996. The evidence of climate change is clear. Ken Stenick is a biologist. He's lived here for 18 years. 
He shows us the traditional fridge used by the people up here, a box in the ground right above the permafrost layer. But the permafrost has melted. The house that once stood above it has been claimed by the sea. Without the permafrost, the ground lacks the necessary stability. The sandy island is easy prey for autumn storms. The biologist is a teacher at the local school. Climate change is a constant topic here. None of the children will be able to live in Shishmaref when they have grown up. Losing their home is a scary thought. For some time now, there's been another worrying development, a plague of dead birds. Yeah, this summer, um, uh, we were seeing lots of uh, dead seabirds washing up, mostly uh, northern fulmars and sh uh, s short tailed shearwaters, that the sea surface temperatures this year were a little bit warmer than normal, uh, the food sources that they have. So we were seeing, um, you know, that we see that the fish uh, eaters were dying off first and washing up, and then some of the plankton eaters. Shishmarev had to act and voted to relocate. The younger villagers were in favor, the older ones against. It split the village. The climate commissioner is stuck in the middle. This is a this is a map with Inuk backwards because we're. She explains the move to the mainland on the map. There's around 10 kilometers between the two locations, but they're worlds apart for the villagers because the move will also mean an end to fishing. The move will cost 300 million dollars, and it's not clear who'll pay. Donald Trump definitely won't. The hunters are angered by his denial of climate change. They want rapid assistance. Uh, I think they got, they're going to have to move us very soon. Otherwise, we'll be washed off the map. Shishmarev isn't just a small village in the middle of nowhere. It's also a symbol. Climate change threatens Miami, Venice and Hamburg too. The Russian icebreaker has come to a stop for research in the icy waste. Alex Cohen is literally on thin ice. His goal is to explore the meltwater ponds. They're filled with fresh water and are a food source for many tiny creatures in the Arctic. The scientist collects important data that allows him to draw conclusions about climate change. Yes, there, there is a climate change happening at the North Pole and we can prove that through long-term data sets. You can't see it easily on a year-to-year -year basis because it's a noisy signal, but when you look at the decadal uh, data sets that we're collecting, then it's a very clear signal. The last few miles to the North Pole. But who really owns it? The political status of the North Pole area is completely unclear. Canada, Denmark and Russia regularly lay claim to it because an underwater mountain ridge connects to their mainland regions. The countries around the Arctic region are currently addressing that question. They're doing research and are filing applications with the United Nations to say how far the continental shelves extend. Once it's proved who owns this territory, this ridge, it won't become part of that state's territory. But that state will get the rights to the natural resources here. At last, the time has arrived. 90 degrees north, the actual roof of the world. It's an emotional moment for Jan Breeder and the captain. Once the ice can support the seven-ton anchors, the passengers are allowed to disembark. At the North Pole, 
the people from 23 nations form a circle and stand in silence for peace on Earth, maybe with a sense of awareness that that peace is under threat because of the changes in the Arctic. The Arctic's a magical place. Will it stay that way in the future? The struggle for the Arctic ultimately could draw many countries into the conflict. But in the end, it's up to all of us to preserve this unique landscape. The Arctic is a magical place. Mankind has been trying to conquer it for decades. And that endeavor's becoming easier. Because of climate change, the ice is melting faster and faster. Now the battle for the Arctic's resources has begun. It's one of the last untouched regions on Earth where people have left few traces. It's something that's very worth protecting. They've long become a symbol for dramatic changes in the once eternal ice. No other oil rig in the world is as well protected against the cold. It can operate at temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees centigrade. Many areas of the rig are hermetically sealed to keep out the Arctic cold. All the important areas can be heated. That means the helipad is always free from snow and ice. That's absolutely vital for the crew. The supplies from the air are their only link with the outside world. The alarm goes off on the Songa enabler. Safety drills are part of the crew's daily routines. They get to the source of the problem within four minutes, which is within the permitted time limit. A good thousand kilometers further south in Tromsø, the Norwegians are moving a different kind of steel giant into position. This is the Songa Enabler oil rig. It cost almost a billion euros to build. The Norwegian company Statoil hopes to discover enormous oil reserves here and has penetrated further north than anyone else so far. The manager's on his way to the heart of the rig, the drilling platform. So what always amazes me is that this pop you see here now, it's just a small piece of steel, right? That's what does the whole job. And it's all this organization and the platform and the engineering are, it's all around this small piece sticking up here and doing all the work for us. At the moment, the ice still presents a natural barrier. Powerful icebreakers are needed to get through it. Russia dominates the Arctic sea routes. This nuclear-powered icebreaker has 74,000 horsepower. 
It's the largest, most advanced vessel of its kind in the world. Even ice sheets four meters thick are no problem for Captain Dmitry Lobusov. This icebreaker can reach almost any location in the Arctic Ocean. The battle for the Arctic is coming to a head. Russian scientists are concerned about the unique landscape. So the fighters for this pancake now are more equipped, more powerful, more rich, so they have a better device to cut this pancake. This Russian giant isn't the only one here. Of course, it can be risky. Uh, we know that uh, lives have gone lost in, in, in oil business, and hopefully it won't happen again uh, because we are controlling the risk. But the risk is there. We can never, uh, we can never look away from the risks because uh, if we do that, of course, we will lose more lives. The human and material effort is enormous, and it's all to one end. Yeah, we like to make history, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I, I know that if we, if we discover an elephant up here, uh, as we call it, uh, it will be historical. Uh, it will uh, gain much more activity up there, uh, which will be good for, uh, for both me and for the business, of course. The Arctic is rich in natural resources. Oil, gas, ores and precious stones have been harvested from here for more than a hundred years. <laughs> 